Hi, everyone. Everyone had a good lunch? All right. No one's going to be sleepy, yeah? Huh? <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. First slide, please. Is anyone here afraid of snakes? Can I show, have a, yeah, one person there afraid of snake, a few more, quite coy. <laughs> What's the first thing that comes to mind when I show you this picture of a blue coral snake? Beautiful? Oh, I'm very glad to hear that. Did anyone think, wow, it's so colorful, it must be venomous? Anyone thinking that? Yeah, okay. <laughs> what about this snake? This is a paradise flying tree snake, very colorful indeed. Do you think it's venomous? No? Yes? Some yeses, some noes. What about this snake? This snake is not very colorful at all. It's just plain black. No patterns on it. Is it venomous? Any guesses? Yes, I hear some yeses. Well, this black snake is in fact a Sumatran spitting cobra. So it's very, very venomous indeed. And the paradise tree snake that you saw earlier, as colorful as it was, it's not venomous at all. So the common misconception that colorful snakes are venomous is entirely untrue. All right, moving on. Does anyone here think that lizards are icky? Oh no, <laughs> a bit more than I thought. What's the first thing that came to mind when I say lizard? Did anyone picture this chicha or house gecko? What if I told you that in our forest, we have beautiful geckos as well, such as this cat gecko that has a cute chubby tail. And if you take a closer look, you see that they have eyes that resemble the starry night sky. Yeah. All right, moving on. What about frogs? Does anyone here think that frogs are disgusting? Oh, no. <laughs> That's a lot more yes than, yes than I, guess, uh, that I, that I anticipated. Okay. So what did you picture when I say frogs? Did anyone picture this toad? This is, a, this is a common Malayan toad. It's something that you find in your backyards or on football fields at night. Did you know that we have beautiful frogs as well in our forest, such as this Wallace's flying tree frog that's bright green and have blacks and yellows in their hands and feet. This frog can be found all throughout Malaysia in the deepest, um, most pristine forests but you don't have to go far to see one. This particular one I found in Selangor. We, I didn't even need to leave the state to find one. And we have other frogs such as this Malayan horn frog as well that is perfectly camouflaged. If it, it, if it were to jump onto leaf litter, it would blend into it perfectly. So why am I showing you pictures of reptiles and amphibians today? Well, it is my hope that my photography will be able to convince some of you today that reptiles and amphibians are in fact beautiful creatures. And in this presentation, I'll be sharing with you my favorite group of animals, which are herpetofauna, which is a term to refer to both reptiles and amphibians. And I'll be sharing with you my experience with herpetofauna and my hobby of herping, which is the act of looking for reptiles and, and, and amphibians. And I'll be sharing more photos of snakes, lizards, and frogs, and also some tips on what to do if you encounter a snake in the forest. Thanks. So how did all this begin? You know, how did my fascinations with snakes started? Well, it started with, uh, when I was four. My mom brought home our first PC, and the PC contained some free software, one of them being Microsoft's Dangerous Creatures. This is an educational software with lots of articles that's very digestible, meant for kids. And they had articles on dangerous creatures like bears, tigers, sharks. But my thing was snakes. <laughs> and specifically, this yellow eyelash pit viper. It's a bright yellow snake with horns on top of its eyes. And even as a kid, I thought, wow, this snake really exists. This is not a 3D rendering. This is not an artist's picture. This is a snake that really exists. Until this day, Seeing this snake in the wild remains to be a bucket list item for me. It lives in Central America. I have to fly to Costa Rica to see one. <laughs> All right, moving on. So Steve Irwin, or the Crocodile Hunter, was another important influence to my life. Uh, when I was eight, the Crocodile Hunter program started airing, and I, I remember trying to catch every episode of it. I would be fighting with my grandma for the remote control <laughs> to watch Crocodile Hunter. Yes. Um, 
as controversial as he was, you know, uh, after all, handling free handling snakes, hand, that is the handling of snakes with just your bare hands, is quite controversial. It might not be the best messaging to send to impressionable young kids. But his infectious passion for wildlife was exactly what was needed for myself and my peers, many of whom grew, grew up to become conservationists, biologists, and herpetologists. So even as a young man, I lacked many of the necessary skills to look for reptiles and amphibians in the wild. And, it, and when I was in uni, I had the opportunity to learn. I studied environmental management in Monash University, and I had the opportunity to go on a field trip to Gunung Mulu National Park. During the, the field trip, we were put into various small groups, and I was lucky enough to put in the frog group. And under the frog group, we were trained to look for frogs using their eye shine, and we surveyed transects or trails throughout the park HQ to collect data on frogs. And when I came back home, I was able to practice the skills that I've learned when I went out camping with my dad. My dad was an avid four-wheel driver, and we would go camping at least once a month, sometimes more. And over the years, I would teach myself how to handle snakes through trial and error and incremental risk. It started with non-venomous snakes, such as this oriental vine snake, and eventually I moved on to handle mildly venomous snakes, such as this dog-toothed cat snake. And eventually I worked up the courage to handle venomous snakes, like this red-headed crate. And while I do not condone anyone to handle venomous snakes, if you do, if you understand the risk that you're putting yourselves into, I would still highly recommend that you use safety tools, such as this snake hook or snake tong, to minimize direct contact with the venomous snake. So as a working adult, I spent a lot of my free time volunteering for Malaysian Nature Society, and I was put in charge of running Malaysian Nature Society Special Interest Group, or HERB Group for short. And under HERB Group, we organize activities for our members where we would go on night walks to show our members reptiles and amphibians. And we also hosted talks where we invited herpetologists to come talk on their research. So uh, today I'll be showing you some snakes that I've encountered during my MNS herb group night walks and also on my other herping adventures. One of the most no notable lifers that I've seen was this blood python. <laughs> so a lifer is the first of a species that you will ever see. And birders and herbers alike would keep a list of lifers. So the lifer list is yeah, a list of animals you really want to see, right? And it's usually populated by animals that are very beautiful, they have interesting appearance, or they're rare, or they have interesting natural history. As for this snake, the blood python is one of three species of pythons that's here in Malaysia. They are very short snakes, about 1.5 meters long, and very chubby, they're very thick. And they have small heads and small tails. That unusual appearance, plus their beautiful coloration and pattern, makes them very popular as pets. And unfortunately, that drives the poaching of this species. Another interesting snake that I've encountered during my guided night walks was this bandit crate. I was guiding a bunch of students from Monash University when they were going through their ecology course at Kuala Selangor Nature Park, where we were lucky enough to witness a bandit crate swallowing a crab-eating snake. It's yeah, a rare opportunity to observe a snake eating another snake. Bandit crates are deadly neurotoxic. And if one were to bite you, it could easily kill an adult human. That said, most snakes would rather expend their venom incapacitating prey than to waste it on a would-be predator. And uh, this is another interesting snake that I've seen during my herping adventures. This is a Tweedy's reed snake. It's a hyper-endemic snake, meaning it can only be found in one place in the world. And as for this snake, it can only be found in Cameron Highlands. I remember going to Cameron Highlands with my friends, and uh, we parked our car, jumped out, switched on our flashlights, and we managed to find three of them instantly, one after the other. We were aesthetic. We went from not having seen this snake at all to seeing three instantly. So uh, from the back, this snake might look a little boring. It's just black. But if you were to flip it over, you see that it has a very contrasty checkered pattern. It has a yellow and black checkered pattern. and yeah, their scales are also very iridescent. It has like a rainbow sheen. My friend Rupert Lewis was able to coax it into this position, and I got this photo, which would then be used as a back cover 
in my friend Tom Charlton's book, A Guide to Snakes of Peninsula Malaysia and Singapore. So I need to remind everyone that this snake is hyperendemic, and that makes it very vulnerable to habitat destruction. And large-scale vegetable farming in Cameron Highlands, if not controlled, could lead to the extinction of this species. Moving on. So frogs, as much as I like snakes, I like frogs just as much, trust me. <laughs> and I'll be showing you some interesting frogs. So as a child, I've always been very fascinated by the poison dart frogs, colorful frogs, in every, that colors from the whole spectrum of the rainbow. And I thought that, oh, there's only colorful frogs like this in the Amazons. But little did I know that we have beautiful frogs like this in our home as well in Malaysia. For instance, we have this saffron bellied frog. They have a dark indigo base coloration and light blue spots that resemble the starry night sky. And if you were to flip it over, you see that it has a yellow saffron belly and an intricate net like pattern. Yeah. And we have flying tree frogs as well, something that's entirely absent from the Amazonian forest. The Wallace's flying tree frog and Norhayati's flying tree frog has large webbing in its hands and feet, which allows them to jump off trees and glide to safety. The Norhayati's flying tree frog is named after Professor Norhayati Ahmad, who is a herpetologist that teaches here in UKM. Yeah. And the Malayan flying tree frog has semi-translucent skin. If you look closely, you can see that she is in fact rabbit with eggs. Yeah. And as Malaysians, we really do not need to go far to see amazing frogs. The banded bullfrog is uh, common in urban areas as well, but they usually live underground. But during high, heavy rains, they come out in droves and they congregate in drains and water bodies. And they'll call by inhaling air into their lungs and pushing it from their lungs to their buccal pouches, making a mooing noise, hence the name bullfrog. They go wah, wah. <laughs> Anyone remember hearing this in your kampong or near your house? Yeah. All right, moving on. So lizards. Amongst snakes, lizards, and frogs, I think that lizards receive the least, least amount of resentment. I think, yeah, but just now when I asked people whether or not they were icky, there were lots of yeses. So let me show you some beautiful lizards. <laughs> so Malaysia is home to many charming lizards, such as these anglehead lizards, the chameleon anglehead, Doria's anglehead, and great anglehead lizard. And we also have flying lizards. Yes, lizards from the genus Draco. The interesting thing about Draco lizards is that their rib cages bend outwards, forming patagiums or wings, which it uses to glide with a high degree of control. And they come in all sorts of beautiful colors and patterns. You can see, yeah, uh, in some species, the males and females might have a different appearance. So there's yeah, a huge variety of colors in them. And we also have flying geckos that have a flap of skin on their side and hands, their hands and feet also have webbing, allowing them to catch air and parachute to safety. And there are many other reptiles that I do not have the time to share with you. Lots of other amazing reptiles and amphibians in our forest. So I hope that my pictures has been able to convince at least some of you here today to want to see snake, to want to go out and try herping on your own. And your next question might be, all right, Stephen, I would like to go, so how do I start? Well, in terms of equipment, all you really need is a flashlight or a headlamp. And the next time you go camping, go on a night walk. Just go on a walk around your uh, camping grounds and go on a walk in your backyard in the local park. If you have access to a state park, you could go to a state park. And you might be surprised with what you can find. But if you do not find much, do not be discouraged because spotting, as with any other skill, is something that can be honed with practice. And you can join lots of online communities where you can pick up pointers and ask experts about tips and tricks and get IDs as well for venomous snakes. Okay, so I'm sure some of you here might not have been convinced to want to see snakes. <laughs> and for those of you that do not want to see snakes, the next time you go hiking and you encounter one, or what should you do, right? So, um, and. Sometimes, inevitably, snakes end up in people's houses as well. And I have personally rescued a few from my friends' houses. So what to do? What to do when you see a snake on your hike or at home? First of all, you want to, uh, I implore you to remain calm and uh, give it ample space to escape. 
and take, take pictures and videos before it does. <laughs> because seeing snakes is quite rare after all. Yeah, on an average night of herping, I see three snakes only, sometimes zero. So uh, seeing snakes is an important event that should be recorded and shared with your friends. And if you're at home, you want to keep track of the snake. You know, if you found it in the second floor and go to the kitchen to get a drink and you come back and it's gone, it's hard for rescuers to come and catch the snake. So you want to keep an eye on the snake, take pictures and videos, and send it to herpers like myself and others so that we can identify it for you. And if it's a non-venomous snake, you might decide to take action yourself uh, by shooing the snake away. You can open up doors and windows and you can shoo them away using a broom. But if you're not confident with doing that, or if it's indeed a venomous snake, you can always call our fire department to relocate the snake for you. Lastly, I'd like to implore everyone here today to reimagine your relationship with snakes. If we can tolerate squirrels, birds, and civets being our backyards, why not snakes? Yeah, learn to cohabitate with snakes. And if you're already so inclined, pick up herp herping as a hobby. Because lifers are memories that last a lifetime. Thank you.